In this video, I'm going to discuss the final statistic of the lecture, which is, or the semester, which is a repeated measures MANOVA. Now, a basic repeated measures MANOVA is simply a dependent variable that is measured over multiple time points. That could be multiple trials, multiple times, like, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. Um, Essentially, it's the same organization as a one-way repeated measures ANOVA. So that's why if you think about your output for either a factorial ANOVA, repeated measures ANOVA, or any one-way ANOVAs you did in 620, fact multivariate output was always coming out. And this you can look back to the mixed factorial data that I had you look at earlier this semester, or when I said print out an extra copy of your own repeated measures factorial ANOVA, really what you were getting in that was components of a MANOVA, even though we were addressing the data from a univariate perspective. Later in this video, you'll see the differences in what happens when you address either data from a univariate versus a multivariate perspective. When you measure a dependent variable multiple times, you can look at it from either perspective. That's fine. Um, there are pros and cons to looking at the data both ways. When, in, when we examined an independent group's MANOVA in the previous lecture, we were examining the mean vector differences between groups. We're still going to look at differences in mean vectors, but in repeated measures MANOVA, we are actually examining the differences of the mean vectors. So. While these are not bolded, and they probably should be, when we take a look at each of these different sets of mu comparisons, really it's representing a series of vectors here. But we have mu time 1 minus time 2, or trial 1 minus time 2, trial 2, um, mu to trial 3 minus trial 1, and mu trial 2 minus trial 1. And just for accuracy's sake, mean vector <laughs> differences. Um, so when we're making these comparisons, we're not looking at comparing each of the means to one another. Really what we're doing is looking at the different um, points in time. So here we can look at this. This is where what are called segments. Um, you know, kind of comparing this segment here in black to now the segment that I am showing you in red. Um, that would be what you would get from a MANOVA. And the example I'm about to use comes from Chris Swartz's dissertation in exercise physiology. So the exercise physiologists who are listening to this video try not to cringe too much as I do my best to discuss physiology variables. Here he measured lactate um, 10 times during or at baseline at the end of each 8 30 second bouts at a max effort sprint on a bike during active recovery and at the end of the session. So person was on the bike. He got lactate baseline, he got lactate eight times during the, or, or at the end of each of eight sprints, so he had multiple um, sprints, and then he also took it during active recovery at the end of the session. Now, depending on the text, some are going to agree with this and some aren't. Generally, and um, generally this is true, um, you don't technically need to review sphericity for um, for a MANOVA, and this is talked about in the um, text, the Weinfurt chapter that I provide for you. Um, but Warner kind of says it should be looked at regardless. You just don't have to make adjustments if you violate sphericity for a MANOVA. If you decide to review data from a multivariate perspective, there is no adjustment to be made. Um, so here you can see with this lactate example, there was a violation, so if we reviewed the data from a univariate perspective, we'd have to read greenhouse geyser and use that greenhouse geyser epsilon value. If we looked at it from a multivariate perspective, we wouldn't necessarily have to do that. Now, there are more conservative adjustments, as we talked about for 
a MANOVA, instead of looking at Wilkes Lambda, we could examine Pelaya's trace, but other, uh, other potential violations would have to come into account because fericity really isn't as big of a deal here. So from the multivariate data, you can see here that we get Bartlett's test of sphericity, um, test the null hypothesis. Test the null hypothesis, the residual covariance matrix is proportional to the identity. Here we have a likelihood ratio. We don't actually have a sig value. It doesn't pr produce that information. That's fine. We don't have that, or we don't need to in this one way. This will become more important when we look at the doubly repeated. So by reviewing this multivariate statistic, again, we, we're going to stick with Wilkes lambda here. Remember, Wilkes lambda is a measure of the determinant of unexplained to total, determinant of total. So essentially, it's the unexplained, you know, unexplained, ratio of unexplained variance to total variance. So we want Wilkes to be small, and in this case, we can see Wilkes is very small. Then Wilkes is converted into an F ratio so that we can put it on an F distribution with hypothetical, um, or hy not hypothetical, hypotheses, degrees of freedom in order to pl plot it. However, from this perspective, if we're looking at the mean vector differences of trials or times, we're going to have non-significance. So we would have to say there's no significant mean vector differences in lactate. Let's see what happens if we interpret the data from a univariate perspective. In univariate perspective, we saw that we violated the assumption of homogeneity of variance differences or the assumption of sphericity. So instead, we're going to look at the greenhouse geyser line the being the slightly more conservative of the options compared to Heinfeld, lower bound being extremely conservative. We read across here, we have a very high F ratio uh, where the F ratio is explained over unexplained, it's 61, and then a p-value that's less than 0 0.00. Down here, we have, and we have a huge partially squared at 87%. This would make sense because as time increases for you physiologists, you would, your lactate would be expected to increase as the ability to buffer lactate would decrease during the repeated sprint activity. Um, so why do you think there was such a difference in the finding? You have to kind of now go back to, well, what is the or what's truly being tested? Whereas the MANOVA is looking at segments, the univariate ANOVA is looking at every single time period. So it's comparing baseline 1 to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Well, not surprisingly, baseline is has much lower lactate than, you know, you can see it's only similar levels of lactate at comparing to the second measurement. After that, there's much more lactate being measured. So there the way that those comparisons of making every single comparison as opposed to the comparisons of the segments that we saw in MANOVA is really what's going on in terms of the comparison of univariate to a multivariate approach. This comes down to, as in all things, what is your research question and the goal of the analysis you're trying to do. Oftentimes, a multivariate analysis is a little bit more convoluted to interpret the understanding of segments. Um, Sometimes the research question just doesn't make sense in a univariate, appro a univariate approach is often, especially when you really do only have one dependent variable that's just being measured multiple times, the univariate approach makes a lot more sense and it's, more, it's easier to report, even if it does have this additional restriction of sphericity. Now, here you can see that because this was measured over equal increments of time, Beyond the pairwise comparison, you could consider a trend or trend analysis, which also looks at the segments but looks at them individually. And we can see in this case, the ninth order wasn't significant. The eighth order wasn't significant. This com these segments, the eight, the ninth order is really most equivalent to what a MANOVA is testing. Um, so here, the fact that this isn't significant is actually pretty equivalent to what we saw before. Um, but not surprisingly, if we go down, 
to, let's see, where we first reach significance cubic. Um, here, what I'm guessing is, you know, we have, or probably something along the lines of the person starts to go up, they plateau a little bit, and they go up again more. Um, so probably something along those lines, although I'd have to plot, um, I'd have to plot his mean a little bit more to be sure. Now, there is a special case of a repeated measures manova that is called a doubly repeated measures manova. This is um, considered one of the most powerful statistical analyses. It's also extremely hard to interpret, and often univariates are just easier anyway. Um, univariates are also the post hoc analysis, so we'll, we'll get to that regardless. So here what you have in a doubly repeated measures MANOVA is you have multiple dependent variables that have been assessed repeatedly and we're now making a comparison of the mean vector differences. So we're going to actually continue on with Chris Swartz's data set where we're going to look at some of his other dependent variables here that should have had theoretical intercorrelations. VO2 max, average repetitions, and relative anaerobic power. So we have his three mean vectors, and because this is a repeated measures analysis, we are comparing differences. So he had three different conditions, control, an experimental one condition, experimental two, and we'll talk about that in a second. So we have to compare that different, or these three dependent variables for this difference, these three dependent variables for this difference, these three dependent variables for this difference. Looking at the same data set before, you can see now control here is that somebody or a participant came in, this was session one for Chris, and they completed his um, repeated sprint um, bout on the bike, um, the baseline, eight sprints, and active recovery, and he collected all of those variables. Then he, for f I believe it was four weeks, they took beta alanine. He gave them rel or appropriate amounts of beta alanine. Um, had them came in and looked to see if that improved their performance over, or over the control condition. A week later, he or maybe it wasn't even a week, it may have been as little as 48 hours later, he had them to come in for set test session 3, which was beta and al alanine plus sodium bicarbonate to see if the two of those supplements together improved performance. Because of the amount of time... Um, required for beta alanine to work because it, it requires chronic use, um, this was not a counterbalanced design. So session one was control, session two was experimental one, session three was experimental two. The dependent variables that I pulled from Chris's analysis for this was maximal consumption at the final measurement, um, average reps per five second interval, so a reps final measurement, and relative anaerobic power. So again, you have Monchley's test of sphericity. If you wanted to look at this from the univariate perspective, we can see that for VO2, he meets the assumptions. For average reps, he does not. For relative anaerobic power, he does not. If we look at Monchley's test, again, we're going to sp specifically focus here on Wilkes Lambda, and we're going to see no significant difference. So from a univariate perspective, we're not really, or from a multivariate perspective, we're not really getting much information and understanding, well, what's going on amongst these variables. This is where I sometimes MANOVA can be extremely frustrating. Additionally, as we discussed last time, MANOVA requires more subjects for power. So the smaller sample size may have been problematic because also look at this effect size. We have a pretty nice effect size in Chris's study. Um, now, if we break this down and what commonly happens, a typical post hoc analysis or an analysis that you do after you obtain a non significant um, MANOVA for a doubly repeated measures MANOVA would be to do the univariates to find out what is the appropriate univariate. And because Chris has um, three experimental conditions and 10 time periods, it's a 3 by 10 factorial NOVA. Um, he would start with the interaction and then move down to the main effects. Um, there is like repeated, or, and this, this word new is probably a misnomer, 
at this point. So we're just going to say a multivariate approach. Much like DFA is a multivariate analysis that can be used as an appropriate post hoc for a re independent groups MANOVA, there is a multivariate approach that can be used to, to examine a repeated measures MANOVA, and that's called a profile analysis. This me measures whether or not um, groups or profiles can be met on a similar set of measures. Um, whether we can kind of create groups based on these. This is kind of similar to a discriminant function analysis um, based on its usage of development of groups, um, but it's using repeated measures analysis. Um, it's testing for three major hypotheses, which I'm not going to get too much into, but just so that you have heard the words, they test for parallelism, flatness, and levels. Um, parallelism is equivalent to an interaction, levels is equivalent to a between groups analysis, and um, flatness is equivalent to a within groups analysis. The major problem and why this is not something I teach beyond what I've just told you is that the major restriction is that to conduct a profile analysis, all variables have to be measured on the same scale. And simply transferring things over to z-scores won't cut it because it actually changes the question too much. So in order to do a profile analysis, the restrictions are so high, and this applies to so few of my students, that while I have the materials and could use it should a student find it interesting, um, profile analysis, one, its results are really convoluted, <laughs> um, interesting, but sometimes difficult to interpret. Often the straightforward univariate analysis in our field is the most accepted post hoc here. Um, and by often, I mean almost always. <laughs> so in this case, now, since we didn't get the significant doubly repeated ANOVA, we'd still go down and do the univariate ANOVAs anyway. Um, it does tax our alpha, so we probably want to make sure we're using a Bonferroni correction in order to avoid that situation. If you look at Chris's data here, you can see that we have no significance for VO2, we have no significance for relative anaerobic power, but if we look at the average reps, we do have significance, not by much, <laughs> but we do have significance. Chances are Chris's big issue is statistical power, though, because look at these partially to squareds. They're all at least, you know, low, on the low end of a large effect size, so chances are that Chris actually has some really interesting findings. He just didn't have enough statistical power to identify it for all of his variables. Um, here, a trend analysis given Chris's sample or data set does not meet the basic assumption. It is, it is repeated measures, but not repeated measures over time. So you would not look at the linear and the quadratic analysis. Instead, Oh, you know what? I didn't have over the eight periods of time. I didn't do the factorial for this. I apologize. This was only looking at each of the conditions, because right, because I said this, these three things were taken at the final measurement. So VO2, average reps, and relative anaerobic power, these were all things that were measured after the sprint test was completed. Um, not surprisingly, we looked down VO2, and we looked down relative anaerobic power. They're all non-significant. That makes sense. If we look at average reps, no difference between the control condition and experimental one, which was bicarb only. No difference between the control condition and the combination, which was, um, or not bicarb, uh, beta alanine. Uh, so two is beta alanine only, three is beta alanine plus bicarb. Where the significance comes in is between the beta alanine only, the two, and the beta alanine plus bicarb, we see that there was slightly higher anaerobic power, uh, or excuse me, higher average reps in the third condition, where you had both the anaerobic or the beta alanine and the bicarb. P value was 0 0.002. The appropriate effect size for repeated measures, um, pairwise comparison, you could calculate a, you could do a Cohen's d, or you could actually do an R. So how would you go about writing up these findings? No significant differ differences in mean vectors was found amongst the control condition, beta alanine, and the beta alanine plus sodium bicarb sessions across three dependent variables. 
give the three dependent variables the Wilkes lambda, the then converted F ratio, the p value, and the partially squared. In follow up univariate ANOVA, a significant difference was found in average, um, average reps across sessions, give the overall F ratio. I gave the greenhouse geyser degrees of freedom. That actually shouldn't be reported. You should give the full degrees of freedom. Um, greenhouse geyser is only adjusted here, which should only be used to adjust to, adjust to determine F crit. Um, so that's a typo on my part. P is less than 0.05, but you know, right on the border. But we do have a fairly large partially to squared. In post hoc pairwise comparisons, average reps was significantly higher in the beta alanine plus bicarb session when compared to the beta alanine session only. I get my T, I give my T ratio was mean difference over standard error, a p value of 0.02. No other significant mean differences were found in VO2. So I would go through that case get cascade of analysis. First report the no significant doubly repeated MANOVA, then go down and look at the um, look at the univariate ANOVAs, then work into your pairwise comparisons, and then identify non-significant findings. So hopefully you found that useful. Please post any questions that you have. Um, bring them to class. And thank you.